the room. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I say good day because it's morning, afternoon in different places. Uh, my name is Josephine Wong, and I am a nursing professor at Ryerson University in Ontario, Canada. And I am very pleased to have the opportunity to chair this session. Uh, today, we have four wonderful speakers who will be able to share with us insight uh, from the experiences of people, populations affected by COVID-19. Before I introduce them, I would just like to do some housekeeping. Uh, one of the things that we would invite everybody to do is to be 110% mindful Josephine, I think your sound has gone off. Yeah, Josephine, please unmute yourself. Thank you. I guess uh, someone muted me. <laughs> okay, so I'll start again. So in terms of housekeeping, uh, today, the first 25 to 30 minutes, we will be listening to our wonderful speakers. We have four of them. I will introduce each one of them just before they speak. Uh, we know that some of you might have uh, wonderful questions to ask that will be in the second part of the session and we i would invite you to actually not use the chat function just so that all of us can really pay a hundred percent to our speakers we do invite you to raise your hand during the discussion portion and you can do that by clicking onto the icon that says participant once you click on that, you will see that you're able to see two uh, icons. One says mute me, one says raise hand. And Genevieve, who kindly will be supporting the session, um, she'll be able to actually mark down who is on the list to, to ask questions. So if that is okay with you, I'm going to move on and actually start our presentation. Uh, many of us um, around the world, we came from different places, when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 pandemic in March, most public health officials focused their energy really on halting this new uh, coronavirus. But within weeks, uh, from where I can see in Canada, it became apparent that the COVID-19 pandemic is more than a communicable disease. Uh, all the unresolved social inequities related to systemic racism, economic marginalization became magnified. We are seeing increasing poverty, uh, undistrib unequal distribution of risk to essential workers beyond the healthcare sector. So today we are very lucky to have four speakers who will be able to share with us experiences of populations and communities uh, affected by COVID-19. Our first speaker is Gautam Ban, and uh, Dr. Ban is a senior lead academics and research in the School of Human Development at the Indian Institute for Human Settlement, Bangalore. He holds a PhD in city and regional planning uh, University of California, Berkeley. He teaches, researches, and writes on the, the politics of urban poverty and inequities, and as well as in urban and planning theory, housing, identity, and social practice. He's the author of the Public's Interest, Eviction, Citizenship, and Inequality in Contemporary Delhi. So Dr. Bana, I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you very much, uh, Josephine. So um, it's a pleasure to be here, folks. Uh, I'll stick to my five minutes, so I'll get straight into it. So we were asked to respond to three questions, and I'll do that just very systematically. The first one was to think about uh, the kind of communities that we work with and the impact of COVID on them. So the core area of my work in India is to think about the intersections between uh, social protection, public health outcomes, and informal workers. 
80% of India's uh, workforce works in the informal economy, uh, which also is true of about 2 billion of the global workers. Um, in fact, the majority of workers in the global south uh, work in the informal economy. And very quickly, what that means is that they work both with vulnerable conditions of employment, uh, but also outside the framework of formal labor regulations, occupational safety health regulations, minimum wages, etc. Um, the other very important part of uh, informal work is that it also tends to be in non-traditional work settings, very often in public space. So the four dominant forms of informal work for us in India are street vending, domestic work, waste picking, and home-based work, and, and um, construction and transport work. So in many of these cities, what the experience of informal workers has been is actually that COVID has created a situation that is as much the breakdown of a paradigm of economic resilience um, and social protection coverage in terms of safety nets as it is about a public health or epidemiological um, impact. And that's a very important thing for us because from the perspective of informal workers in cities of the South, there is actually a distinct impact of the lockdown as a preventive strategy for prevention of COVID as there is of COVID itself. So the communities we work with are actually equally at risk, both in terms of their social and developmental status, as well as their health status, um, to the effects of the kinds of lockdowns that were put down, partly because also in the Indian experience, there was not a variation between the rules of stay at home and work at home which actually may fit certain urban contexts, but do not at all translate to Indian urban cities where homes are typically in very dense informal settlements, where staying at home does not mean physical distancing, are often without adequate infrastructure and services. So therefore, when water supply is erratic, the washing of hands is not possible. And um, as well as uh, the impact also of not being able to work in public space as cities was locked down. So, the fallout in India has actually been a severe economic and safety net fallout as much as an epidemiological problem. And that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is about the kinds of difficulties in research and practice that we've been experiencing. For us, actually, in our engagements with our partners, our main goal has been to see the kind of knowledge that they immediately need to mitigate the worst of these economic and epidemiological impacts on workers. So for example, with a domestic workers union that we work with very closely in the city of Jaipur in North India, we helped the union conduct a 600 worker rapid phone survey to understand food insecurity, um, uh, epidemiological risk, as well as the need for immediate cash transfer and substance. We saw very clearly that the economic and epidemiological risk uh, changed very dramatically from day seven of the lockdown, day 14, day 30, and day 45. Um, India had one of the severest lockdowns with the harshest conditions, even though we did it early. Um, and what that resulted was that many activities that broke quarantine, broke lockdown, was not actually because of irresponsible health behavior or the lack of knowledge, but actually was because there was absolutely no possibility without daily income that workers were forced to break lockdown conditions in order for economic survival. So I'll end by saying that what is a critical need for us in terms of research support and new directions is to view the response to the pandemic as much as a response to building safety nets for informal workers and addressing core human development fallouts and outcomes as it is to think only about COVID prevention. And I think um, one of the things that remains unknown right now in India is that we are quite convinced that non-COVID morbidity and non-COVID mortality have dramatically increased and worsened um, because of the, the focus on COVID at this point. This includes everything from an entire round of vaccinations being missed for young children, increased maternal mortality, um, looking also at intra-household food contraction with long-term wasting and stunting effects on children, something that India already struggles with, but also a very uncertain economic recovery back to quote-unquote normal times. And I think that some of the responses we're looking for support towards are actually experiments and new ways of delivering social protections um, in the context of post-COVID recovery, uh, without which simply even flattening the curve is not going to allow recovery. And I'll stop there.
Thank you very much, Dr. Bon. Um, there was a message that someone could not hear. Uh, I heard the entire presentation very well, so I would suggest that you check your computer. Our next speaker is Dr. Denise Pimenta. She is an anthropologist and researcher at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, which is part of the Brazilian Ministry of Health. She has an interdisciplinary interest and experience in public health, health education, health anthropology, information and communication, global health, health emergencies, and neglected uh, tropical diseases. So now I'll pass the mic to Dr. Pimenta. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. So I'm presenting uh, Brazil, and uh, I thank Kenneth for the, for the invitation from uh, Fiocruz, which is the, the research uh, branch of the Ministry of Health here in Brazil. So I don't know how, how you guys are familiar with Brazil, but it's been a very tragic uh, case in, in terms of COVID in Latin America, and especially we hit yesterday 80,000 deaths uh, a mark. And we have our main challenge to be really uh, concise in my talk is how uh, the political and economic climate is making uh, everything worse in a sense where there's no coordinated political uh, control actions and uh, vigilance and a response really uh, in Brazil. So this makes everything uh, much harder in terms of the scientific production and all the actions that Phil Cruz has been. And it goes from vaccines to social science. So there's a whole array of troubles and uh, and being Latin America, one of the one of the most unequal uh, areas in the world, the, the, uh, um, in terms of the territory and the different vulnerabilities, it's very clear in Brazil in terms of race, in terms of gender, indigenous people, and all sorts of Brazil is very big country and uh, it's continental, <laughs> so it's been a huge challenge for us in the Ministry of Health. Uh, in Rio Cruz to deal with this, and especially in the social aspects, because the the consequences and the and the the impact that the disease has been having on different populations and different areas has been very different, uh, very distinct. Man, how um, these are impacting uh, people. So, uh, so we we've, we've had uh, some projects funded, uh, basically in social science uh, from Fiocru uh, in terms of organizing everything that's been done in, in Fiocru and we had like, uh, an observatory which has been a hub to organize everything that's been going on in terms of research in Fiocru and other uh, social science associations and foundations national and international so this has been a really interesting uh, get together of people trying to look at the same problems and create synergies, national and international as well, which I think is something similar to what we're trying to do here today. And we also have uh, two, two Gates funded projects with Bill and Melinda Gates. One uh, is with LSE, which is in, in the UK with the London School of Economics. We are looking at the uh, syndemics, which is how other, other uh, epidemics which are already happening in, in the country, for example, dengue and Zika and all of these really important problems which got hijacked by, by COVID. So this has been really important for us and we have this ongoing uh, project. We are also organizing a, a center of um, an interdisciplinary center of uh, health emergencies in Pio Cruz which is from a past experience of the, of the Zika Social Science Network. So we have a lot of experience from the past in health emergencies, which we're trying to build upon. So we, we're, we're sort of at a point now where we're legitimizing social science in health emergencies, where traditionally it's very biological and, and biomedic based. And also another big project which I'd like to share and we can talk uh, later on is um, a, ge a gender, a big gender uh, project with the, also with the Gates Foundation uh, coordinated by Julia Smith, 
from Simon Fraser University, and we are also organizing Brazil does it, Brazil case. Né? So gender for us uh, is also a very important aspect in Brazil, in Latin America. I don't know how you guys have been following, but there's been a huge uh, anti-science, anti-human rights, uh, and, and women's rights, reproductive rights, we've been moving uh, against these. Uh, so now, on top of all the problems we already had, political problems, we went through two ministries of health, ministers of health, and all sorts of, we can talk a little bit more. So I think the main challenges for us, and I, you guys asked, is how to produce science, social science, in this climate where the government is actively going against scientific institutions and against uh, scientists themselves. So this is a huge, huge problem at the moment for us now. And uh, I think that, that's it. I think we can, I've tried to be very, very short so we can, there's a lot more to talk about and we can find uh, five minutes to talk about everything. It's a huge uh, challenge, but I think there's a lot that very similar to the, to the Indian presentation, so we can we can talk further. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pimenta. We will now go to our third speaker, Dr. David Kawa Majiri. Um, he is a senior lecturer in the Department of Social Work and Social Administration in the School of Social Sciences at Macquarie University. And Dr. Uh, Kawa Makfujiri is a medical anthropologist with public health training, uh, experiences in integrating biomedical and social behavioral and community perspective to health sciences in research, education, so that um, there could be really robust uh, research outcome that will come out as well as in interdisciplinary training. So now I will pass the mic to Dr. Kawa Mefajiri. Thank you very much and uh, for having me. Uh, I am currently in South Sudan, in Juba, in lockdown, uh, not in Uganda. But that's fantastic to be here. And um, I will say that um, <clears throat> A lot of what we're experiencing is very similar to some of the previous speakers, uh, except to say what we have experienced in Uganda and here in South Sudan is that a lot of the governments came down uh, with a very top-down, prescriptive, um, very forceful, um, understandably, very forceful measures. Uh, understandably during an epidemic, uh, the first time it's broken up. What we are experiencing is that they are taking a little longer than maybe the Western governments have done in easing, uh, and yet the disruptions in lifestyle, livelihoods are, are really immense. Um, I will say that we were lucky, and we here I mean a group of social scientists in, uh, that belong to a, a, a network called uh, SONA Global, which is a um, social sciences network uh, trying to study infectious threats and antimicrobial resistance, funded by the EU, by the way. Um, we had already started what we call a vulnerability assessment around uh, December into January and February. So in a way, we started our vulnerability assessment uh, before COVID actually became a real issue, uh, at least in our setting. So we kind of are lucky to have had some sort of reliable, reliable real-time information about vulnerability, how risk communities, uh, communities at risk can be prepared for emergencies. And then upon us came COVID. The, experiences uh, that people are having uh, include, of course, tremendous disruption in livelihoods. Because remember, uh, our economies are very small. And so what we would call a middle class, a middle class 
is uh, something that many economies in Africa are kind of happy about, but we have noticed new vulnerabilities among those kind of groups that we otherwise thought were stable. Uh, so for instance, people who work in the service industry in Africa, one, people who work in private corporations and had to go home and do not have insurance, do not have, so the social protection has exposed new groups. Uh, however, for those conventional, usual uh, vulnerable groups, uh, they've continued to have to bear the brunt. Uh, there are a lot of problems for most of those groups, including mental health issues, domestic violence, and interpersonal violence is on the rise. Uh, sadly, child maltreatment, uh, and then some neglected, I wouldn't say neglected, but increasingly being forgotten, maybe, they are at a risk of being forgotten health conditions. People who are in the area of maternal health, sexual productive health, and other chronic illnesses. As I come to the end of what I need to say, perhaps is that uh, that we are going to remain facing a lot of challenges in our work. Uh, as I speak now today, there's a lot of tear gas and striking and all that going on in, this, in the town. Uh, and that is because of people trying to resist uh, some of these uh, social measures uh, intertwined with political, already there's been a lot of political mistrust, distrust of governments, uh, Yet these are the systems, governments and humanitarian agencies, these are the systems that have been funding, supporting a lot of developmental work in poor economies. Uh, at the same time, they fund our work. They, we work through them, we work under their mandate. So for example, our health-related research, we have to work under ministries of health. And I think we will get some resistance in a way, not so much in the Brazil format where the government doesn't support science. In this case, where the people are so suspicious of elite scholars. And then the usual issues that are going to happen will be technology based, if you want to stick to good ethics. Uh, for us, our setting technology is really, really poor. Um, it's going to be a challenge. I cannot, it's difficult for me from this setting to talk about uh, ways of support that are outside more financial support. And yet they're asking me to discuss. Um, uh, but of course, they are, we would expect that in, on that third question, we still need a lot of capacity building. And these kind of meetings we are now experiencing, uh, doing away with the need for a lot of income, a lot of money, for me to be able to listen in and share with colleagues from the West. Uh, this would not have happened before COVID. I, I'm pretty sure it would have needed air tickets and the rest. Um, why don't I stop there for now? The five minutes are up and uh, it's unbelievable. Thank you so much. Over. Thank you, Dr. Okawa Mavajiri. Um, now I will pass the mic to Dr. Susan Lapine. Uh, you have to turn your mic on. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for having me. It's amazing to join everyone and just even these brief five minute uh, overviews of the country context just highlight the extent to which um, you know, the, the, the global picture uh, mimics one another uh, in thinking around inequality. So I'm just going to begin. I'm going to also just tackle the three questions, but I just wanted to start with two provocations uh, from my uh, own work in South Africa, and maybe they can just jog something. So the first provocation comes from Jake Skeets, who's actually a Native American writer. And he writes that the world before COVID-19, quote, was already lethal and that the systemic disaster capitalism has diminished the possibility of hope, for there is no past to which we would want to return. If we yearn for a time before the pandemic, what do we yearn for? I think this is a really critical question that I've been posing 
uh, as I've been working together with uh, colleagues from Australia, Eleanor Anderson, and my colleagues here in South Africa, um, what is it that we yearn for in the past um, and as a way of pointing to the future? And again, Carnito Mohammed, an anthropologist from South Africa, writes, this is not a war against a virus. The war for a just political economy, however, was fought and lost so long ago that we think it is okay to send people to face a virus without the necessary equipment to protect their lives. And so this notion of precarity is absolutely essential and it connects these two provocations. So the social science is absolutely integral to shining a light on the historical production of inequality, uh, specifically with an eye to imagining new modes of social life predicated on equality and justice. My own research in South Africa has been on the militarization, the intense militarization of the COVID response, where our president Cyril Ramaphosa released 75,000 uh, soldiers, which complemented an earlier 30,000 soldiers with police, uh, giving new powers to uh, everywhere from park rangers to allowing citizen arrests of, of people who are breaking with the very stringent lockdown um, uh, emergency response. Um, and just, just to highlight, uh, as of yesterday, there were three, uh, 300,640, uh, uh, 3,64,328 cases. I'm so dyslexic, I can't read the number. 5,033 deaths and 191,000 recoveries. Um, these, these population numbers are, are important to set against side the fact that we live in a country with 7.7 .7 million people who are HIV positive. Also, uh, Cape Town, where I live, has the most intense numbers of tuberculosis in the world. So as well, this question of syndemics and the co-production of disease. So when we ask about the COVID, and we ask about the look of a similar kind of state HIV or TB, we might, some of us uh, in the social sciences are asking what, what might this country or what the world have looked like if a more active and engaged has led to the intensification of this. So I've tried to frame my own work around the militarization as almost a country lived here through the park. Uh, harsh lockdowns for black uh, citizens, or they weren't citizens during apartheid, black populations, there's been a kind of knee-jerk reaction uh, towards um, a, a repress, repressive military state, which is very interesting. And as earlier um, mentioned in the context, I believe, of, um, sorry, in the first Gautam in India, uh, when people break with curfew, that houses in informal settings don't have uh, inside toilets, and so people have to walk quite long distances just for daily ablutions and sometimes more than once a day and are getting fines for simply leaving their homes. And so the question of systemic uh, um, and folded into that increased gender-based violence, child abuse um, is absolutely essential. So COVID is an, a virus that's feeding or cannibalizing in a way on these, these structural forms of inequities. Um, all right, so just uh, to summarize this, a healthcare intervention of the magnitude then raised by the South African government needs a strong infrastructure based on an economy of compassion. This is really, uh, I hope, where some of this research on militarization will point. Diseases of poverty, including HIV, tuberculosis, hypertension, and diabetes, plus the additional public health crisis of gender-based violence, drug and alcohol dependence, and food insecurity, co-mingle with vices of power, systemic racism, and privilege. In the context of these multiple layers of vulnerability, kind of toxicity, the presence of the state in the form of curfews and surveillance technologies, however violent and punitive, has also been greeted, and this is uh, critical, by some as a form of state care and concern. For more attention is, uh, so, so far more attention than is needed to track the iatrogenic impact of the milit militarization of the pandemic globally with an eye to build and so in terms of the challenges, uh, very briefly over the next 12 months, it really has to do with field work. I'm an anthropologist who usually works in the field with people uh, face to face, uh, moving through in my car or on foot. And so we've had to move to digital kinds of eth ethnographic work and be it, it, 
limits our repertoire of who we speak to, to those who have to take either cell phones or Zoom or um, MS Teams. So the challenge of research and training our postgrad students this COVID era ways in which we engage with other kinds of infectious and non-infectious diseases. Um, and so it's a question then on, on how can funders support, uh, maximize the impact of our research. I thought that was a really significant question beyond the funding. And one of the ways as a social scientist would be in to find ways that the funders could elevate the status of our social scientific work, uh, both for uh, policymakers, state departments of health, uh, the military, hospitals, and clinical management, so that we don't just report and, and, and weave analysis, but that it lands in some meaningful context so that we are uh, somewhat empowered. Um, one way to do that might be through thinking about research on multimodal platforms, radio, podcasts, short films uh, that can be shared, of course, using social media like Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I've seen quite a lot on international broadcasts. And then, of course, the work of connecting uh, social science researchers with one another, as this platform is doing here with epidemiologists, virologists, and uh, collaborative projects, uh, which lean into the interdisciplinary framework. So that's me. <laughs> that's our work in Cape Town. And thank you. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, so. I just want to kind of resonate, you know, for one minute and then I'll open up to, in general, uh, we had heard from our four very insightful presenter about the different challenges that have been posed on different countries, but it seems like the same theme came out that is, um, you know, precarious, um, economic condition where they're shrinking of the middle class because of lockdown. But more importantly, what I'm hearing is that the most marginalized people are always at the forefront whenever there is any kind of crisis, whether it is environmental, natural disaster or pandemic, then they are the one that don't even have the basic condition to really follow the public health kind of guidelines in Canada in some way compared to other countries because we are higher income country. It appears that we would have been in a much better state. Uh, but the thing is that even though in Canada, we had emergency response funds that actually support people who could not you know, go back to work, there are hidden population because we are a white settler society. Racism play in a major way we see a surge of anti-Chinese, anti-Asian racism in Canada. Explicit, outrageous violence. And at the same time, we see very unequal distribution of vulnerability and risk because our frontline workers, essential workers who are not really just in the healthcare system, actually in many other essential work, service industry, groceries, living in situation where they really, it's hard for them to do the physical distancing. So now we are also seeing the differences in who actually get infected and who are affected by most. And in one of the projects that I'm leading right now as a rapid response, there are people who don't have uh, Canadian permanent residency status and many sex workers who are actually kind of behind the scene underground, they cannot actually access any of those government support. So we do in all countries actually are seeing inequities um, affecting who are most impacted by COVID-19. So now I will open up to our discussion for the remaining of the time, we would welcome questions and as I said before, if you click on participants at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you see that you can have an icon that says raise hand. And Genevieve will help me to make sure that all the questions, everybody who put up their hand will have a chance to ask the questions. So I am not seeing any hands right now, and maybe I could open this one question to uh, our presenter. 
So when the government uh, in your country is really wanting to keep this uh, coronavirus, a new one, down, and yet people don't even have access to washing hands and all that kind of stuff, what are some of the strategies that maybe local community groups actually had kind of come out with? Because uh, I'm finding that in Canada, sometimes it actually take the you know, collective action amongst community members who see this as what's happening and they actually do something about it. And I'm wondering if those type of movement are starting in your country. Uh, so maybe I'll go to Dr. Barn first. Um, sure. No, you're, you're very right. I think you're seeing a range of responses. I think, uh, you know, many communities are, while vulnerable, are also very resilient and also used to fighting these fights. Everyday life in many of these contexts are a constant sense of self-provisioning. I know that's very true of the Brazilian favelas as well. Um, and so communities have been mobilizing, for example, to quarantine, not at the household level, but at the street level. So what happens is that if you take this informal settlements, the entry and exit to the settlement become sort of with, with improvised barriers and self-regulation. There are some very good examples of um, community reporting treatment uh, uh, protocols. Um, and I think that in many cases, we've had a little bit of an easier time than Brazil because our state response, at least in major cities, has been quite good about building government COVID care centers um, eventually so that many folks do have a place to go to for isolation if they cannot isolate at home. It took a little time, but we got there. So I think that communities, where communities have had the ability to self-organize, we have seen some very good responses, including some community quarantine in, uh, innovations, finding two, two shacks that, are, that the community decides are meant for isolation. Um, but I also want to emphasize again that this is a double-edged sword because it puts a lot of pressure on communities that are already very vulnerable economically and infrastructurally. So sometimes it's a vicious circle where the communities that are the most resilient then also have to fight the hardest battles. Um, but again, in the context of the pressure on wages and economic distress, that's the combination which really leads to, I think, uh, many kinds of uh, difficulties. But some governments in India have been very good about large scale feeding programs, civil society response has come to food insecurity. So we have seen large scale uh, response in different ways. But I think the question sometimes is that these are infrastructures that even in normal times, have been deficient. And it goes back to what Susan was saying. If you have a weak social safety net, that safety net cannot magically recover through a pandemic. It, it, it was vulnerable to begin with. And it goes back to the point of saying that epidemiological interventions cannot answer the absence of fundamental social safety nets. Um, but disasters show how broken they are. Great, thank you. So I'll open up to other speakers. Uh, Denise? Yes, it's the same. Uh, we've had a, we've seen a, a very interesting interaction between the, uh, many societies for the favelas, for the women, for our, for quilombolas, which are the uh, native uh, indi for indigenous people. So we've had all sorts of, of but it's been very uh, down up uh, organizing. And uh, what what we have here is a. a a fight between the state and the federal and sometimes the municipal level. Again, the political uh, aspect is, is, is strong here. So uh, it, we've been trying to work uh, with this and, and depending on how each uh, area is organized. But we've seen similar uh, resilience uh, here as well, where, where in the use and, and making of masks and all sorts of, of uh, social technologies where the communities are sharing water and alcohol for to clean hands and all sorts of uh, uh, ways of surviving really. You know? Some uh, people have been calling this a, a genocide in Brazil you know, as uh, uh, it's been very straightforward uh, actions of not doing anything really, which has been uh, calling a lot of attention. 
So uh, in, in, uh, for us, it's very, very similar to what you um, mentioned. Uh, this will be uh, Susan. Yeah, also following on, um, uh, throughout South Africa, the um, activism and, and consistent pressure on government for services to clean water, to decent living conditions, to sanitation, to rubbish removal um, has been ongoing and it hasn't stopped, it hasn't ceased, though um, much of the protest now happens, unlike the kinds of extraordinary um, emergence of people on the streets all around the world with the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, which has coincided with, with COVID. Um, it's been quite extraordinary to watch on the news from here, people packed into streets protesting the, the BML movement and not actually seeing the same kind of uh, movement that, that I'm so used to seeing every day in, in South Africa, whether it's just in Cape Town or Johannesburg or KZN. So it's been quite remarkable the extent to which people who can stay home have stayed at home, actually. Um, though the, the specter of homelessness has become far more intense. I mean, just driving my kids to school this morning, um, there are tent, new, you know, new tent camps emerging all over. And, and um, so the homeless are being criminalized and pushed out. So um, uh, my phone's going, but never mind. Um, but you know what I did want to say that there's been some interesting responses from the state as well and I don't know if this is true in your context but um, they have put a prohibition a complete ban on alcohol and tobacco um, uh, which has been a very interesting moment um, you know it's crippled the economy alcohol is one of the main export economies as is tobacco so it's lost a lot of jobs and income but the rationale is that uh, accidents car accidents and and injuries caused by alcohol take up too many beds and with the kind of bed shortages that we have in hospitals they thought the best way to um, free up beds was in fact to ban alcohol um, cigarettes were also banned because of the pulmonary uh, condition. So, so it's been another layer of distress. So you also find an informal economy happening where there's all kinds of illegal sales happening in communities. And I, I, I <laughs> that's what you were ta talking about. But there has been an amazing amount of mobilization around different layers of regulations that um, attend the lockdown. Great, thank you, Susan. Uh, David? Yes, thank you very much. Um, some of the resilience has been along since, as those ones mentioned. But what I will say is the government has had in Uganda, I know for sure, uh, been very heavy handed, so, you know, very heavy handed. So we don't have the, like the demonstrations are quickly, uh, you know, squashed and the curfews are so strict, close to this militarization that that um, Denise talked about in Cape Town. Uh, we have most of the enforcement is done by the military. Uh, so that's, that is something very important. However, um, in terms of resilience, yes, we have some community uh, self-advocacy, uh, self, uh, you know, community engagement with, um, you know, community-led resilience, which has helped a lot to fill some of the gaps that the public service or the private humanitarian groups uh, could not uh, take over, uh, especially when the, the groups that need it were previously not vulnerable. So you didn't think people who come every day to the market were vulnerable or to shop, so they never needed uh, humanitarian agencies to provide hand washing, for example, soap every day. But these are people who live hand to mouth. So telling them to stay home by force and bringing very, very uh, low quality, uh, limited rations of food has meant that people have to share a lot, cope a lot. I know, for instance, also that some of the businesses have closed physical premises, but life has gone on now. People have adapted. So think about like markets and shops. And once the malls are closed, the back streets have people packed with all their cars uh, and selling out of their uh, bonnets, boots. You call it a boot, what, the car trunk, car trunk. And so you find a long line of 20 cars. And those are the shops now. 
selling out of their trunks, hawking, so to speak. They're like hawkers. They're those kind of, and then they're able to get food, access to food, those kind of um, models of resilience. Some groups that continue to suffer for us, uh, in Uganda, we host probably the largest number of refugees uh, being surrounded by countries that are in conflict, especially in the West and the North, uh, and the Northeast. So we host over 2 million refugees. And uh, some of them, of course, come to town, to the cities, those who are well off to do. And the others are in camps. The ones in camps might be uh, you know, surviving much better, if I can say something like that, because they have the camps are run by the humanitarian agencies. But the ones in the cities are living in the, um, for lack of a better word, you forgive me, but they're living in the slums. Uh, they are living in the congested places with no services. And they're struggling because even before COVID, they didn't have access to services without uh, an identity card, a national card, you know, that kind of language barrier. You know. Yeah, so, but, you know, uh, we are seeing a lot of resilience, a bit of struggle now, a bit of uh, struggle. The biggest, the other, lastly, the last big problem we have is some of the locally, local initiatives are being confounded by, you know, the politicization that is going on. We have elections coming soon. So sometimes you have potential members of parliament, particularly from the opposition, who are seen trying to fill this gap, bringing food trucks. And, and then when people come out and mass to collect the food, the government may say something like, oh, you're, you're breaking the mass gathering uh, regulation or directive. And so you have all these running battles, tear gas, and it's it's amazing yeah i'll stop there for now over great thank you david uh we encourage all the participants in the room please raise your hand if you have a question and before i see other hand i guess i will have the privilege to kind of ask more question so i have heard from our four presenters about how politics is really mixed in with any kind of pandemic responses. We had heard that yes, communities do have resilient strategies, but it also put a lot of stress on the communities, especially those that are already bearing a lot of burdens because the pre-COVID-19 inequities or challenges are already there. What I would like to pose to our presenters is actually, I know that um, research is going on, there are movements, as some of you were saying that there are resistance, and of course, uh, some of the people who protesting are met with, um, you know, increased militarization, tear gas, and, but, I guess humans are resilient and people will uh, resist. So with what we know about uh, the pandemic right now and with the kind of research that you have been doing, what are some of the strategies that you and your colleagues or uh, organization that you're part of have been reaching to your local or national government? to address the issue that is beyond the, the communicable disease. Actually, um, I was very touched by Dr. Barnes saying that people are not dying from COVID-19. They're dying from food insecurity. They're dying from all the other stuff that should have been corrected even before the pandemic uh, occurs. So I'll open to anyone and maybe start with uh, Dr. Barnes. Um, sure. No, it, it's, you know, I had a slightly uh, unique experience because when the lockdown began, I was asked um, by the government of Delhi, where I am, to be on an advisory panel for emergency hunger response. Um, so I actually worked very closely with the state um, on, and I think in Delhi, it has to be said, the government did respond on a very large scale to try and combat that food insecurity. There was 
a uh, the food, uh, f- cooked food was given in 1500 schools across the city where a million people ate every day lunch and dinner um, uh, the, uh, India has a subs- public distribution system for food for subsidized food in normal times but it doesn't cover everybody and it's and its coverage was expanded in response to many demands and organizing and protests to expand state food delivery to those not covered by the food scheme. As I know in South Africa, a a special cash transfer was made as income support and those kinds of schemes were definitely done. I think that I would have liked our governments um, to, I think, trust and engage with communities a little bit more directly um, than they did. So for example, I think where we were not sufficiently uh, good was in helping a um, helping um, communities think of community quarantine facilities. So at this point, the only option is a centralized state quarantine, which in many cities is taking time to pick up because people are also hesitant to go into large state facilities, you know, and far from homes um, and the like. And I think that in terms of engaging with, um, I think there are some exceptions. So one of the densest uh, informal settlements in the world is a place called Dharavi in Mumbai. And Dharavi has emerged actually as a uh, best practice case instead of a warning case. Everyone expected it to be the place where, so in some ways we're also in an interesting moment because many informal settlements have been looked at with appreciation by the same state that normally looks at them with vulnerability and fear and often criminalization, you know, because their response has really been appreciated in terms of government. So, but I think that if, if we were to go into a lockdown strategy and we had anticipated some of the concerns that would come and worked with communities to say, what are decentralized strategies? I think our state still in the end wants to control and centralize a lot of its response, what they would call the heavy handed response. Um, Ours may not have been as heavy handed in most cases, but it was definitely still too centralized, you know, and that means the structure moves a little more slowly than it could. And it can't tailor itself to the diversity of contexts that are there in India as well, right? Um, I mean, there's such differences across states and regions like that everywhere. So I I do think that, um, I think the last point I'll make is, I think some of the opportunities to, for example, work with worker associations and unions, um, had they been taken more seriously, we would have been faster in the social protection delivery. So for example, a cash transfer, one-time cash transfer was announced for daily wage uh, workers, but the state didn't know how to reach them especially in the context of lockdown, right? These are people who don't exist on databases because they're informal workers. The unions could have reached them, but they weren't partnered with. So I think a deficiency in partnerships for sure. Great. So thank you so much. So I'm hoping what you share as those insights better be documented in case we have another uh, crisis that happened. Uh, How about Susan or Denise or David? We have a few more minutes. I would like to hear your response. Yes, Susan. Yeah, just very briefly. I mean, one of the things um, over the past, you know, since lockdown in May, um, most of my time has been taken up with graduate students and undergraduate students who've had to suddenly study uh, remotely and 30% of whom don't have any access at all to the kinds of technologies that would allow them to participate in learning. Um, and so we have a two-tiered strategy. One is our online learning and the other is to develop these packages of, uh, literally I think we printed 350,000 pages from our faculty, which have gone out to a thousand points all around the country so that students can work in an offline way in those very, you know, courier pickups. But through our, what we've done, these care calls, which is calling over the 1,500 students that don't have access and learning about their stories um, of not just not having access to online learning, but also the kinds of hunger, illness in their families, dealing with death in the context of not being able to attend funerals, and what it means to grieve and what it means to bury uh, the dead, whether people are dying of COVID or HIV or malnutrition. Um, There's a, a, a new way of being in hospital that's very lonely. And so some of the sort of immediate concerns are about around sort of, sorry, my dog, isolation, um, and grief and, and, and burial practices and land. And so those are the kinds of ways that through students, um, you know, we've been working. And then on another level, sort of trying to move out of an academic space and into my own neighborhood, I've noticed that people who 
um, are increasingly um, walking around suburban areas to look for food in, in rubbish bins are being treated like criminals. And private security companies are literally coming and pushing people out and then reporting them on these WhatsApp groups like, you know, a black man seen in a yellow cap uh, rummaging through rubbish bin. I've shown him the way. Um, really, um, in it, unconscionable kinds of dehumanization at work. And so I've set up um, working groups for the, some of the security force people in our neighborhood and also neighbors just to talk about what it means to live in a context of such gross inequalities, which COVID feeds on. Um, and, 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 and this moment has brought into our, our home life, into our street life, um, the kinds of inequities which have been here since what you know since the beginning of slavery really and beyond um, and so I think it's through those micro initiatives of, of talking and, and bringing some of our, our work some of our readings to ordinary neighbors on the streets just to do peer education um, those are the kinds of interventions I don't have I'm not lofty enough to work with governments yet so but I'm open to having a job if <laughs> would love to but anyway so those are some of the things that, that we've been doing yeah but thank you Thank you, Susan. So you pointed out something very important about isolation and mental health of people, people who don't have access. And I really appreciate what you just said about how we must not allow people using COVID-19 to further dehumanize people. That instead of focusing on someone who had no food and had to go through the garbage, and then you just kind of further punish them and further traumatize them. Be using COVID-19 as an, 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 as an excuse. And I think globally, we really need to address that. Uh, how about David? Do you have anything to add to about uh, our um, conversation here? Yes, um, I think for me going forward, what I see is a need for uh, finding some sustainable or affordable ways that we can access communities or where mm. community-owned programming can happen. I say this because the, over the last two months, uh, there has not really been enough meaningful community engagement to facilitate some of the individuals or the households or the communities to take charge of their own health. And I say this, uh, their health and social well-being. Uh, I say this because Clearly, in our setting, we uh, depended a lot on public service. And we know with COVID, it has been tested to the limit. When you have um, uh, these directives that disrupt livelihoods, we see that the social protection is not there. It's really there. It has been there, but for few people who can access it, as I said, some of the middle class now suddenly find themselves very vulnerable. So I wonder going forward, what we are interested in is how can we have some meaningful community engagement uh, so that these individuals, households or communities take charge of their own health and their neighbors and protect them from the impacts of such pandemics, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for some of what we've done for us now, here where I am in South Sudan, but also in Kampala, we are going ahead with some, if it is research, it's research in understanding community, ways to understanding the communities, to, to understand which resources we can leverage, community-based resources. If it is um, uh, like here in South Sudan, we are trying out a community feedback mechanism. And by that, we mean using those local, regular lay people to tell us in real time, uh, every two weeks, what is new, what are you thinking, what are you seeing, as opposed to sophisticated researchers and the like. Um, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, and, uh, a reminder, we will be, we will be called in back into the main room in um, one minute, 55 seconds. Okay, um, so maybe Denise, you can use 45 seconds to add your opinion. <laughs> Yeah, it's very similar. It's just it's been so interesting listening to everyone and, and listening and seeing how similar we really are in, in terms of problems. That's that's been uh, great to unfortunately and the bad and the good things. <laughs> it's very it, it cuts across. And it's uh, that was very uh, similar 
um, interesting for me to, to understand better in, at this meeting. But here, the a big problem has been violence because with the loss of jobs, uh, there's been a, in, a lot of alcohol uh, has skyrocketed and alcoholism and violence has been very huge problem towards women and special kids and even more vulnerable groups. So this has been a huge problem where people don't have enough to eat really. So this has been, uh, food is the main uh, thing uh, in terms of social action and now, because we, we are now four months in. So a lot of uh, no income where people have already now lost their jobs. So very similar. Great, thank you. So I have 30 seconds to wrap this up. Um, so we had heard from uh, our four amazing speakers about what's happening within their country. I guess as we leave this virtual forum, I would like to pose for us to actually further think about that internationally, globally. How will we actually need to be responsible for each other? Because we know that it all depends on the country and the income of the country. And we know that low income countries had low income because of previous colonization. And that's something we need to talk about. And we'll end on that note. And thank you so much, uh, David Gautam and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we can go on.